Um, well, welcome all of you. Uh, it's wonderful to see you here. My name is Jonathan Tame. I'm the director of the Jubilee Centre in Cambridge, which seeks to connect the Bible with uh, big issues in public life around the economic, social and political spheres. Um, one project we've been doing for the last few months is looking at artificial intelligence and particularly through an economics perspective. Um, and we want to share a little bit of some of the, the ideas and the questions and issues and, and the fruit of the research that we've been doing. It's Callum, my colleague here, who's um, been doing the research primarily, but we will kind of work on this uh, seminar together. So we've got this rather good title, I think. Um, the End of Business, Artificial Intelligence, Economic Disruption and Hope. If you come here to, to get the answer to that, I'm afraid you'll be disappointed. But we hope we're going to raise some of the questions which we think the whole AI revolution is, is forcing us to ask. And I think just the, uh, the uh, interventions we've had already today are very much a, a, along this line. So we just want, I want to just start with um, an overview of what we'll do in the next uh, 40 minutes. Look at what, what is the problem and pitch it in a certain way. Then we'll look at who is driving the development of artificial intelligence in the economy. Um, then we'll look at this question. Um, Nigel Cameron talked about risk and so on. So we're going to dig a bit deeper into that. What's the likelihood and the type of the disruption to the economy that we might expect? And then is there another end of business, uh, hope and the biblical vision? So we want to just, just briefly at the end uh, touch on that and then have time for some questions all being well. So... What is the problem that we are going to look at? Um, it's perhaps this idea of disruption max. Uh, the key questions that no one quite has the answers to are, will this artificial intelligence um, technological revolution be more or less the same as previous ones, such as the enclosures revolution to, uh, to farming, the factories revolution um, of the industrial revolution which impacted and transformed manufacturing, the automob automobile revolution which influenced transport enormously, the white goods revolution, you know, washing machines and things like that, which um, transformed the world of domestic service. A hundred years ago or so, something like 15% uh, of people were employed in domestic service in Britain, all gone. Um, the, the computer revolution which changed offices and now perhaps the internet and globalization revolution. So many previous revolutions around technology and new technology. Painful for many who lose jobs initially, but in the long run, more jobs are created. Will it be like that? Or will this be a different kind of, um, of kind of disruption max where the new technology replaces human labor entirely rather than enhancing it? Will it permanently destroy more jobs than it creates? That is the, the key question um, that we're looking at. Will there be this persistent, large-scale technological unemployment which then causes uh, uh, huge um, social, political uh, issues to, to grapple with in the economy? And together with that is the question of um, if more and more of the um, income from the, the economic process goes to machines, in other words, the owners of capital as opposed to the owners of labor, what will that increasing um, inequality of wealth and income do to our society and the co cohesiveness of our society? We saw just after the financial crash in 2010-11, the Occupy movement was a sense of a large number of people saying something is desperately long, wrong, something needs to change, but it fizzled out after a while. But there's this sense of, which we'll come back to, the social legitimacy of the economic system that we're uh, part of. And will this really push and force the question of whether capitalism or financial capitalism, which is largely what we're seeing now, is it still fit for purpose? And um, so we're going to be um, asking the question, you know, could this AI revolution bring an end of business as we know it? Um, will we be asking such searching questions about the nature of business that we will, uh, it will prompt a, a, a wider social change? So, 
just starting with some questions there. And very importantly, uh, we need to look carefully about what we mean by artificial intelligence. And so I'm going to hand over to Callum to start to address that. Great. Oh, that's not ready yet. So we've been talking a lot about this term, AI. We've been using it a lot. I'm not um, presuming to give the definitive definition here, but it is quite a slippery thing to talk about, actually. It's difficult to pin down. I've had the pleasure over the past uh, couple months of interviewing several um, professors, practitioners, experts, and researchers in the field of AI. And it's been um, a fascinating experience for me to dig a little bit deeper and, and, and learn about what some of these people think about AI and how they understand it themselves as people who are involved in this field, um, who self-identify as people involved in this field. So um, I do apologize if any of the things I'm about to talk about are elementary for some of you. But nonetheless, I think it's really important for us to discuss these things together and be able to have a clearer, be able to articulate what we mean when we say these things and, and, and what we don't mean, emphatically what we don't mean, because that is one of the things I see as uh, one of the bigger dangers. So very broadly conceived, of course, AI can refer to any system really that accomplished <coughs> tasks in a way that mimics humans. AI, that, that term has quite a history. I'm sure many of you are aware of it. It's not new, of course. Um, people have been using this term for uh, decades and decades. But in the current dialogue, it seems to me, uh, more often than not, it can be connected with science fiction um, or even used as a marketing tactic, oftentimes, if people are trying to sell an interesting, new, innovative product. So at its best, it seems that uh, AI connotes a, some type of tool powered by uh, machine learning, let's say. At its worst, AI is simply a misnomer. I'd like to give one quick example of just how misleading dialogue about AI could be. The best way to illustrate this is with an image. You've already seen a sneak peek. This is probably my least favorite image I've come across in the last few months. Uh, of course, this is not, this is a game of Go, presumably, being set out. This is nothing like how AlphaGo or AlphaZero play the game of Go. Uh, these systems don't actually see real physical pieces, nor do they have an apparatus with which to pick them up. And if they did, I can assure you it most probably would not be this type of a clumsy anthropomorphic hand. Um, from what I can tell, with these types of pieces, maybe something like a suction cup. They've, there have been quite a bit of successes using these types of things to pick up objects. Um, it's actually really impressive, that photo there. It's a, it's a good photo for what it's worth, but I wouldn't even be surprised to learn that there was glue somehow involved with getting that piece <laughs> positioned just so. Nevertheless, this image can be deceptively misleading because it conflates a well-known milestone, right, computers surpassing humans in playing the game of Go, with fiction. A robot may be playing Go exactly how we do as humans, for the same reasons that humans do. Images like this can subtly nudge us towards assumptions. If we aren't careful, our minds could envision this anthropomorphic hand connected to a body with a head, maybe reaching to the table nearby, grabbing a cup of coffee, taking a sip, or in a fit of rage after being defeated, grabbing some type of a weapon to harm its opponent. Uh, this stuff might seem far-fetched to us here in this conference, but I can assure you um, there are people who are seeing these images and reading these stories who um, are thinking things uh, along these lines, especially when we throw in the mix of science fiction movies out there. Thus, our discussion today views AI fundamentally as a tool that helps us do repetitive tasks, whether that be detecting spam, sorting images, or driving a car. Traditionally, computer systems have been given rules in order to accomplish such tasks. These rules can be called algorithms. 
My wife, uh, as it happens, actually teaches computer programming to secondary students. And she often, when explaining what algorithms are, uses the analogy of a recipe. Recipe has several clearly defined steps and help you work your way through to reach an objective in the end. These types of algorithms or recipes are found in everything from our phones to our cars, as we know, in the form of code. But rather than just a few dozen steps, there are often millions upon millions of lines of code. Now, the other phrase we have to bring into discussion, which is not going to be new to most of you, is machine learning. Uh, and this also is not really new. It's been around for decades and decades. Machine learning helps us save time because basically, instead of being given individual steps, these recipes with steps one by one, it's able to learn the rules on its own. It saves tons of time. This is an amazing technology. Chess computer games have been around for a lot longer than I have. But the reason IBM's Deep Blue was so much better than older versions is because rather than all these individual steps put in, it was able to play a lot of games by itself and learn the rules, as it were, to be able to come up um, with how to play the game. Now, the final element in this equation, and really the main reason um, we're at this conference, it seems to me, and others have alluded to this, is data. The growing amount and availability of data. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this more in a little bit. Uh, we'll come on to that in ne the next section. But for now, for the time being, although this is hardly a watertight definition, we might think of AI as something which performs human-like tasks, machine learning as the training involved to get us there, right? because there are other ways that we might be able to get AI, but machine learning is the best way, one of the newest ways to get us to AI and data then as the resource that makes that training that happens in machine learning processes. Data is the resource that makes the training successful or effective. Uh, so we're going to return to the economic kind of heart of this talk. Jonathan, I'm going to hand it back to him, and he's going to explain a model that we use to approach the business world. That was a brief summary of what uh, Callum just said. Um, and ju just trying to bring some clarity there to, to the language, which I think is, is really helpful. So um, what we are wanting to, to look at is um, the question we, we we've keep coming back down to is that technology doesn't advance by itself. Okay? People uh, pay for it, invest in it, they've got certain aims in mind. Lots of decisions are made around um, the development and deployment of um, of this technology. Now, we began a research project to look at the potential impact of this AI revolution on society and especially the economy last year. All of our research in the Jubilee Center is, is grounded uh, pretty much in two core ideas. Firstly, that there is a biblical vision for society, um, which God sought to demonstrate through shaping a new nation, uh, which we call Israel, through biblical law godly leadership and the Holy Spirit. And that, it's the Old Testament is that sense of God forming and shaping um, a, uh, a human society that was supposed to be a model for other societies uh, around. And then that model, the way we translate it to 21st century uh, context, is through the framework of relationships. Because whilst politics and technology and culture have changed beyond recognition in 3,000 years, the fundamental nature of human relationships, of, of right and wrong, of love and of hate, of, of mercy and forgiveness, all these um, relational issues are the same now as th they were uh, two, three thousand years ago. So, what we therefore can, th th the way this translation works is we, we look at the, the biblical model for society and say, and, and try and understand what were God's norms for relationships in that society. And when we look at the same kinds of relationships in society today, how can we uh, discover and interpret those, those norms for now? So that's what we call relational thinking. So that's a terribly brief uh, summary of it. But, um, and Jesus says, if you remember, we get this from Matthew 22, where he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love, your neighbor, uh, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, because on these two commands hangs all the law and the prophets, meaning that that 
society shaped by biblical law is ultimately about um, loving God and loving neighbour. And all those examples in the law are of what good and right and loving relationships look like as opposed to exploitative or abusive uh, or harmful relationships. So that's kind of the framework we use. So how do we apply this to the world of artificial intelligence? Well, we need to think about who are the main actors, if you like, uh, behind artificial intelligence in the economy. And um, uh, this is where we've chosen to focus on organisations that are leading in the development and deployment of artificial intelligence. In the Western world, those organisations are mostly big uh, corporations. Uh, in places like China, Russia, North Korea, it's likely to be state-sponsored uh, institutions and organisations. Um, so... That, that's why we say organization. It's business or, or other kinds of organization. But those are, uh, each of those organizations have a network of stakeholders who are involved in one way or another. And so we're looking in this framework at the relationships between the different stakeholders um, in these organizations. So this has gone the wrong way around. Okay, never mind. Let's, uh, so we, we start with directors in the middle. Um, and these are the, the people who ultimately make decisions. If we look at first the, the relationship with employees, so if you think about um, this whole question of how many jobs will be lost to AI, that is going to take place in the context of the relationship between directors and their employees. Okay? It's not a, just a mathematical decision that's given to us by a, an automated financial director or whatever. It's a human decision. And it's about a human relationship. So what are those questions? Will, um, will the automation of tasks be done to enhance productivity or will it be done to replace jobs altogether? Um, a couple of years ago, somebody visited a German uh, factory, a family firm that employed two or 300 people manufacturing uh, in some way. And, and the person visiting said, do you know, I expect in a few years' time you could probably replace most of these jobs uh, with with uh, artificial with robot robotics or artificial intelligence. He said, I could do it today, but the reason I don't do it is because I have a commitment to my employees. So there is that relationship which determines the, the, the speed or the outcome or the nature of those kind of decisions. Um, likewise, attitudes to retraining. The whole gig economy right now is a, a relationship where employees are wanting to have less and less responsibility uh, for their staff by making them self-employed, self -employed, zero hours contracts in the gig economy. Um, it's, it describes a change in the relationship between directors and employees. Um, another relation, oh, sorry, I should go back to this one, of, um, whoops. Now what do we do? Let's see if this goes back to where we were. It doesn't, so. Um, looking at the director-shareholder relationship. Uh, this is what I alluded to before, that if the more and more of the profits from business are going to the owners of capital, um, that again is a relational issue. A huge investments are needed to develop artificial intelligence. And who are those investors? And what are the aims of their involvement? We've seen in the last decade or so how more and more it's short-term financial returns uh, which are driving investment decisions. And, um, and the long-term profitability of the company, there's fewer and fewer investors that seem to be in there for the long term. So how will directors, again, of these organizations or companies, who are usually shareholders also, and this is in the case, obviously, uh, of uh, 